Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Hi, welcome to today's podcast. Um, today we're talking about potatoes. This is the stuff you really want to know about potatoes. Is your mash the best on the block or a bit of a flop? Are your roasties crisper than anyone else's? We're going to give you lots of new ideas if you're looking for a change and make sure you're doing things right. But my first question for Tom is, if you could only eat pasta, rice or potatoes for the rest of your life, which of those would you choose? And now I know what you're hoping me to say here because <laughs> the podcast is about potatoes. So you know, I might throw it all under the bucket. Oh, yeah, rice, definitely right. <laughs> no, it's potatoes. Come on. I mean, they're British, they're robust, they're solid, they're seasonal, they're beautiful. So, yeah, definitely going to be well, potatoes. Well, can I say right up front, thank you, Tom, for that. <laughs> That's very, very generous of you. Why does everyone love potatoes so much? What is it about them? Well, they change, they're seasonal, and they're so adaptable. You do so many different things with them. Listen, everyone loves a roast potato, mashed potato. Listen, who doesn't love chips? So, you know, there's, they're so beautiful. They contain different flavours. They change all the time. But also, it's something that we grow. They're very British. We're a northern European country that has root vegetables, and potato is the king of them. Yeah, yes, they they come in so many different shapes and forms and colours. And uh, but you say they change during the year. Are you saying that the flavour of them changes during the year or the sort of potato that you get? Uh, yeah, well, changes. everything everything changes. So uh, like in, in the summertime, the, they're sweeter. The sugar content is higher. Oh, right. And what happens is that sugar content slowly turns into starch. And that's, that's, why, that's why it's quite difficult to make good chips in the summertime. Oh, fascinating. Now, do you have a particular favourite? variety or does that change as well during at different times and during the year so i'm i have to be 100 percent honest with you we are very quite we are very technical with the chips and the potatoes that we use for in the restaurant so in the restaurant world we have a company that measures starch and sugar content and then says these are the best potatoes to make chips with or roasties or the sort of thing that you're looking for so uh, it, I that and that changes throughout the year. So so it's hugely seasonal because different fields, different weather conditions, different it really does alter how you get very crispy chips or beautiful roast potatoes. And that I mean it's so dependent on that. And and so I have no preference to variety apart from when it comes to things like new potatoes. So some small Cornish new potatoes, absolutely delicious. But listen, the king of new potato has to be Jersey Royal. It's just the soil that it's grown in, the flavour that it gives, you can tell Jersey Royal a mile away. And the story of it and the shape of it, of course. I was brought up in Jersey, so I'm a huge fan of Jersey Royals. Have you seen that they grow them on the on the kind of cliff side? They yeah. have to be suspended on ropes to harvest them. It's amazing. I mean, the it? things people do for potatoes, Potatoes, yeah, but they, so many people don't know that, you know, yeah, the way that those potatoes are grown and that and where they can get the flavour from. And it does make such a big difference. Now, people talk all the time about Maris Piper. Now, because we're not as scientific as you, when we go to the shops, we just kind of pick what is on offer there. And Maris Piper seems to be the kind of the, the, the one that's never going to let you down. Would you say that is true or is it? No, 100 percent. It's kind of like a, a it's it's like an old family estate car. It does everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an old family estate car car just with like a big engine in it so you can have fun in it if you're on your own however it gets the dogs and the kids in so it's kind of like it's one of those potatoes that's multi-use and it, it does make good chips it makes a good baker the the uh, the flesh mashes really nicely so it, it's a good multi-purpose potato you can't go far wrong with it when my chips next go wrong i'm going to blame the the time of year rather than myself therefore <sighs> that's exactly um, what you need to do tom where do you stand on these colored potatoes because i'm not sure about purple or black potatoes yellow ones kind of fine but but what do you think of those well they normally tend to be quite waxy in terms of its texture i think i mean if you're looking for a cut vegetables have color carrots i mean look at those everyone thinks they're orange they started off orange, but you know actually they started off they didn't start off orange they were originally purple yeah. and black and yellow and so th there's many variants in them and it's about the flavor what tastes the best i mean for me it 
it's nice that they're coloured, but I wouldn't pay any extra money just because they're, they're purple or they're black. I suppose they look pretty on the plate, don't they? Do, do they? I mean, do, do they? <laughs> I mean, that's a question that's well, in my head. I go, if I want a potato on my plate, I'm not sure I want it purple. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> well, you're a food designer because obviously you have to design your plate to be visually amazing, whereas I just designing the plate to look nice that evening. So, you know, we want to eat it. But but you obviously have to worry about the colour of things. And I can imagine a hint of purple could be a little bit beguiling for you sometimes. Yeah. I, to be honest, I don't really worry ever about colour. What I worry about is product and is it being showcased in its best way you allow product and produce to sing for itself and so if you can show if you can find great produce in the first place and allow it to be show itself and be very very special that's the most important and i have to be honest i think there are better tasting potatoes out there than purple ones Right. Well, that's very reassuring to me. That's that's what I really wanted to hear. You I must don't admit. need a purple potato <laughs> to make your food great. You just need a good tasting potato. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, where, where where do you stand on potatoes as part of a healthy diet? You are someone who has become really famous for your, your the, the your reformed eating. Mm. So, do potatoes uh, worry you at all, or, or do, are you reaching for them in a different way or for yeah, different so, reason? Yeah, very different. So, I've ch- kind of changed my diet. So, I lost well over. 10 stone by doing um low carbohydrates so potatoes weren't on the menu they were they were like they are higher in carbs so they're higher in sugars and they the starches it's all carb so i went okay ditch the potatoes by the way you uh, interrupt say you look on very fine form if i might say so. thank you very much you're very <laughs> whatever, kind. You, whatever you're doing it's suiting you <laughs> thank you but uh, but I've, I've recently changed to looking at a calorie controlled diet um just because kind of like my gym training and the way that I do stuff um, fitness wise has changed. So where I need to get carbohydrates into my diet and I think a lower calorie um, diet now suits me a little more as being more balanced. So potatoes are in there. However, like deep frying them, that's special treat stuff. That's not everyday thing. But lightly boiled, I mean, the, the new potatoes, uh, mashed, but without, with zero fat yogurt through it rather than loads of cream and butter, that this begins to suit my diet a little bit more. However, cream and butter are amazing. If you want to make the best mash, that's where, that's where you've got to go. But that is special occasion and treat stuff. So potatoes can be part of a healthy diet, 100%. So you could you could make mash without the cream and the butter by adding. Did you say low fat Greek, Greek yeah, yogurt zero, or low fat zero, zero, zero fat Greek yogurt? yogurt nice yeah. stick, stir it through. Lower fat creme fraiche, all of those sort of things that take flavors and make it absolutely beautiful. It's not as rich and as indulgent as you would think. Super special mash is. However, it still make you can mix it with uh, semi skim milk. You know all of those sort of things that loosen it up and lighten it, and it's flavors you can get if you buy beautiful tasting potatoes and then great nutmeg on it season it up beautifully all of those sort of things create beautiful flavors definitely potatoes are part of a very very it can be part of a very varied and healthy diet and so those lighter things give a kind of not an illusion but they give a mouth feel of something silkier without actually piling on the fat exactly that yeah however if one did want, if it is that special occasion, Tom, <laughs> yeah. that you've mentioned, and we want to um, super we up our mashed potatoes, um, can you tell me the process by which you make you make your dream mashed potatoes? Okay, so the way we make it at the two star restaurant and the two star hand of flowers is we we um, get very nice. Where, where every table is a special occasion. Every table <laughs> is a special occasion. We want to get it right. So, so we gently simmer. Um, not boil rapidly because if you're boiling rapidly what's happening is it's breaking down the potato from the outside quite quickly and that potato then starts to absorb the water okay and you don't want watery mash so you gently simmer poaching in salted water basically the potatoes until they're cooked all the way through okay yeah. then we did we you dr- cut them quite small so no, they cook a bit quicker or not chunks. no they're, they're, they're fairly big chunks. again don't cut them too small because again if you cook them cut them small and cook them very quickly they start taking on the water you and get you that don't, that waterlogged look and when you drain them there's this kind of they almost stuff look coming out exactly isn't it that. You're, you're losing a lot of the potato because it's kind of leached out isn't it yeah so you don't want to do so this. you want to poach them until they're just cooked well, and, no, and, or and cooked gen- all gently. the way but nice and gentle and, yeah. and 
Sometimes in recipe books, it'll tell you that takes 20 minutes. However, it probably takes closer to 40 on a gentle poach. Right. And then drain them in a colander or on, uh, uh, it's probably the best way of doing it. And then leave them for a couple of minutes just to dry out a bit, okay? Yeah. Maybe stir them once or twice. It doesn't matter if they break up too much. Then we put them through a potato ricer. A ricer. Yeah. So, and then we put them through a, a very fine mesh afterwards so we rice them and then a secondary mesh so we really work it and then we probably put about two-thirds equal parts butter and cream and two-thirds weight of potato two-thirds weight of butter and cream goes into the, the same amount of potato wow so, yeah so, it's, so it, and, 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 and it's it absorbs worked. it absorbs that it yeah. does yeah yeah and then heavily seasoned yeah so it's rich smooth creamy delicious it's a yeah. lot of work yeah to create something beautiful i mean i'm with you on the rice that i've got a rice that i've had for about 20 years and it's it's a marvelous plastic ricer that just carries on rising and it's brilliant but i hate the action of putting things shoving things through sieves it seems to use muscles in my arms that aren't very comfortable and it's very tiring do you give that to the junior chef to do or what well, actually junior chefs probably start off doing it although <laughs> senior chefs will jump on it it's, it's kind of like quite a therapeutic job as a chef it's in a kitchen lots of jobs like that are the monotony are, is quite good fun because it's, it's a switch off it's a job that you've got to get done and you compete against yourself but kitchens are quite um high adrenaline environments so you're always driving yourself and always pushing yourself you can't daydream and drift along in a kitchen you have to drive yourself so getting mashed put through a potato ricer and then through the through the fine sieve is you, you are push 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 and it creates an energy level that gets you ready for lunch service okay well i'll just have to uh, persevere with that and carry on doing it because i know the result is is fantastic because i've done it once or twice but i it has punished my upper arms and i haven't particularly enjoyed it and it saves going to the gym <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and the consistency sometimes i get so enthusiastic with the butter and the cream that it ends up a bit sloppy and and kind of oozes a bit too much on the plate. Do you watch it very carefully or do you beat it in? Yeah, it, keep working it. And even if you find that it's too sloppy, keep working it and don't uh, stop. Right. Keep working, keep working it, keep working it, keep working it. And it kind of, it will kind of absorb it and help thicken it and give it, um, I suppose, a strength of character. Just keep pushing it and strength working it. Strength of character. Working. Um, there's a myth around that if you um, beat mashed potatoes, it might not be a myth, with... Uh, a plastic spatula yeah. that that does something to emulsify the mashed potato is that do, yeah. do you use a plastic spatula all the time plastic spatula all the time and it's kind of like slowly stretches the glutens in it and the starches and that helps to absorb the cream and the butter and the more you work it yeah plastic spatula is always the way to do it not a whisk Right. Okay. Well, I, I think that my mash is going to be top of its form from now on, as long as I can just bite the bullet on getting it through the, the sieve. Yeah. Could we talk chips? Because yes. chips are, I know you might not want to talk about chips as they, they're, you know, saved <laughs> up for very special <laughs> occasions. But there's something that, you know, they're a real high art form of the potato. And I'd love to know what you do in your restaurants with the chips that I, mean, that I can copy at home. Yeah. I, do, I mean, I don't want to bore you to death with it, but they are the triple oh, cooked. They please. are the triple cooked ones, and we triple cook chips because now I'm sure people have made chips before, where you you put you cut them and you drop them in the fryer and you fry them till they're crispy. You put them on the plate. And by the time you sit down to have them to eat, they've gone soft again. And, and the reason why that is is because a, a potato is is pretty much mostly water. So you've made the outside nice and crispy, but the inside has still got loads of water in it, which has created steam. So you're steaming the chip from the inside out. So where you've got it crispy, there's still too much water content inside the potato. Right. And that's why your chips go soggy. So the purpose of triple cooking is to get rid of as much moisture as possible. So the first cooking process is being blanched or steamed, cooked all the way through. Very similar to like we were talking about with... Um, making the mashed potatoes cook very gently and then we gently lift them out with a slotted spoon. That's not spoon. in oil, that's in water the first cooking. In water, yeah. In water, right. Salt okay. water. But and they're that's already chip-shaped. Shaped. They're chip cut, shaped. cut into shape. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then you take them out and you leave them to dry on a like a cake rack. So you gently remove them from the water with a slotted spoon and you put them on a cake rack and you leave them to dry. And when they dry, what happens is the outside of it begins to crackle and, and break up and it, it dries out. And that kind of crackle then when you put it into a fryer at 140 degrees so that first and that first process of cooking you can leave until they go cold it's no problem then you drop them into a fryer at 140 degrees and you cook them until well pretty much most of the bubbling stops so 
And if you've got the right content, sugar and starch, they won't color up too much. Then you take them out and you can put them in a tray and you can leave them to go cold. That's no point in leaving them in the fridge until you need them. 180 degrees, throw them back into the fryer and that's when they go really nice and crispy. And those first two cooking processes were getting rid of moisture. The last one is crisping up the outside and it will stay crisp because you've got rid of the moisture from the first two processes. Sorry if I sent you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> with the chip explanation. <laughs> I've been making notes. <laughs> I've actually been scribbling that down so that I can I can replicate that when I'm feeling really uh I really want to do the job properly. But again it, it's key it goes back to the potato. So if you've got a potato with too much sugar, which is why it's quite hard to make chips in the summertime where the sugars are very nice and sweet and that's why new potatoes are sweet and delicious, then when you're coloring them in the fryer they go dark too quickly before you've got rid of the moisture. So you still get soggy dark chips or if the starch content is too high they just go really hard and crunchy without having too much color on them so finding that perfect balance and that's where a maris piper going back to our family estate car does a job and the maris piper is normally good all year round fantastic there's an awful lot to this cooking isn't there you know you think old oh, chips just you know cut up some chips and put them in a pan but you're doing everything like three times at least in your kitchen to make it better than we can do it at home is that is that what you set yourself exactly. yeah well exactly that it's, it's just to wreck it i've never thought food should be challenging in terms of flavor combinations or um uh, the food that we should be eating. I, I've always been, uh, food should make people feel comfortable. Actually, it's not food, it's environment and restaurant and pub or whatever it is you do. People should feel happy to be there. The environment should feel comfortable. It should be a great one to be in. And if that means that you can have mashed potato and chips, then you go, okay, well, that's what people want. And I love that as well. How do I make it better? How do I make it the best? And that's what I'm looking at doing. So mash, you understand. Chips, everyone understands. I just want them to be the best chips people will eat or the best mash that people eat. Yeah, I, well, it sounds to me like they will be. But but the other thing that I'm interested in here is that you, you seem to have a very kind of caressing touch for these potatoes. You're caring for them in all their different processes and giving them, you know, a lot of love along the way. Whereas I think one has the impression that, you know, it's a world of, you know, knives being thrown in a professional kitchen and a great deal of violence being done on, on ingredients. <laughs> but you seem much kinder than that. It, all the best places respect the ingredient. You respect the ingredient yeah, first. Yeah, I think they the intellectually process. respect it, but you seem to respect it from, you seem to physically respect it as well. A hundred percent. But it, I mean, it's. I mean, this is from a professional point of view. That the last point of that we do as chefs is the final part of a journey. How long has it taken a potato to grow? You know, someone has put that into a field. Someone's planted the seed. Someone's looked after it, grown it, then harvested it, brought it to you, aged it in a in in, in a shed or a warehouse or whatever. Has packed it, sent it to you. And we're the last little bit of putting it in a fryer and sending it to you. We, we you know, the same when it comes to uh, the same when it comes to livestock or it comes to poultry or it comes to whatever. It takes all of these things have taken a process of time to get to that the kitchen is actually probably the last little bit so we are the last guardians before it goes to the guest and that's the most important thing to allow that journey to be shown in of that produce in its best light Fantastic. We're, we're going to come to roast potatoes in just a moment. And I know that you've got the ultimate way to do roast potatoes, which I think will just massacre the world of roast potatoes and take them <laughs> take them by storm. Um, but I wanted to ask you before we, before that, what's the most popular potato dish in your restaurant? Is it the mash or the chips? It's or it, chips, 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 chips. Because, because well, people, you do them so beautifully, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> but also I think when people go out to eat, they feel that they are celebrating or doing something special or just it's a nice occasion or it's something. So they treat themselves, you know, not many people really make chips at home how you know the only chips that most people have at home are out of a bag from the freezer onto a tray and put in the oven yeah. for 25 minutes you know it's kind of like actually going out and having real potatoes treated with love and respect as chips okay they're not healthy or the healthiest however they are special occasion stuff and they do taste great so yeah, chips are by far the most popular. Yeah, when you have some from a packet, they um, they just remind you how good the real thing is. I've uh, I don't know yeah. if you've ever had anything su successful chips from a packet, but I never have. As, no, not as far as I know. I know. I, I think we str people struggle to find it. I mean, we are, we do work quite closely. We are looking at working quite closely with a company to try and help develop something for us regarding how can we get great chips 
like that frozen and it's still it's very very difficult it's a really difficult process i know that some people feel that there's something in potatoes that calms them down and makes them feel good do, do you get that from potatoes or, or or other foods do you do you uh, do you find that they i mean they, i don't know the science feel good. in that or if there's a medical thing but there is something that's very comforting about potatoes but i think that's root vegetables on the whole and i think that's i, th- I think potatoes fall and um, fit into that world of comfortable eating you know it's something that makes you feel happy whether it's a steamed pudding whether it's a casserole whether it's your mum's roast dinner all of those sort of things i think potatoes fall into that space so yeah i could i could see why people go this is nice it's filling they're robust they're hearty they're wholesome they feel you know they everything about them makes you feel like you're getting a hug yeah so i can get why people yeah feel like that definitely yeah, and you 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 had them as a child, and there's nothing to they're not dislikable. And I, have you ever met anyone who doesn't like potato? I think anyone loves, Never loves met potatoes. Anyone who doesn't like don't potatoes. They? Do you have a thing for gratin dauphinois? Because that's a, that's a favourite of mine. Um, and I've got a recipe where you slice them very finely, and then you bring them to a simmer in the milk. And that kind of kickstarts the process and kind of brings the starch out. And it means that it's very um, sort of mousse-like, the finished gratin dauphinois. Yeah. Do, do, I, you do, do you do gratin dauphinois in the restaurant? I suppose do, you do everything, don't we do, you? We do, yeah. At we some do, point. We do. It's, it's, it's not on all the time. However, the methodology of making it, so it's very similar to how you say, how yours was, except I don't cook it in the milk. So we bring the milk and cream up to the boil with garlic and seasoning and heavily, heavily seasoned. And then you slice the potatoes and you layer the potatoes right. again and again and again through the tray. And then the hot milk you pour over the top, then another layer and then the hot cream over the top, and then another layer and you keep layering it through. So what's happening is the warmth is beginning to kind of leach the starches out of the potatoes. And then you finish it with probably about a centimeter of cream above the potatoes maybe just a little bit less and you put it into a low oven and for me this is this is all about low and slow cooking so it goes into the oven at around about 140 150 degrees and then every 20 minutes you take it out and you get a fish slice and you just press the potatoes press them down press them down back in another 20 minutes press them and it feels like you're going nowhere but eventually what happens is all the starches begin to squeeze those potatoes together and it's that slow cooking process it's a bit a little bit like making clotted cream that the moisture is beginning to evaporate from the cream so that's reducing down the starches are coming out and then by the end of it you end up with this kind of like a solid cream infused potato block with a layer on the top and then you just turn the oven up to about 200 for the last 15 minutes and leave it to gratinate on the top take it out and then you've got it and it's not split it's not separated it's just this beautiful very simple and wonderfully made dauphin wise so that's definitely the best way to do it oh it sounds marvelous did you develop that yourself or is that a french way of doing it no i, le- I learned that uh, off yeah. a chef that's you know years of training so i learned that from a chef called alex bentley who used to um be head chef at a restaurant called monsieur max where i was sous chef at, and it was great and alex learned that method off a chef called phil Britton. so it's it, all of these methods come down and Phil Britton used to work for Nico Le Dennis, who was a three mission star yeah. chef. So all of the all of those very beautiful, simple cooking methods of uh, chefs learn. But it, there's so much about it; it's not rushed. You can't go home tonight and go, "I'm just going to make a dauphin whilst for tea." You could do a blag, easy, quick version. However, something like that takes three hours. You know, it, it's a case of love and touch and understanding, and knowing when to stop pressing. Going, actually, that's set enough now. And they're all things that come with practice. I'm getting quite. Calm hungry here but we have got something to eat in a minute Ooh, so lovely uh, <laughs> so if we can if we can only hold off that'll be uh, a treat um just to finish with i wanted to ask you about crisps have you ever made crisps my granddad used to make crisps in a in a frying pan yeah we make crisps we've done different types of crisps so we do things where you dehydrate potato starch and then deep fry it so a little bit like a little bit like quavers you know that kind of like puffed up potato yeah. starchy flavoring we've done things like that but then there's um something very famous called pom gaufret which is a, a kind of like a crisp that you traditionally serve with game where it's that crisscross oh i know yes and you, you take the potato on a jet on one of those big mandolins and you turn it and you turn it and you turn it so each time is a quarter turn and as you slice it through it's got this lovely like crinkle cut crisscross it's kind of miniature lattice isn't it exactly yeah. that and then uh, yeah and then it's a very similar method 
to the chips, but we just gently blanch them and only cook them once. So in boiling or simmer in salted water, cook until they just go soft, leave them to dry on a cloth and then deep fry them at 180 degrees. And they go really nice and crispy and season them afterwards. So yeah, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're garnished for game dishes, but they are, they're beautiful. They, they are beautiful crisps. Do you ever buy a bag of crisps? I haven't bought a bag of crisps in ages. I've got to be honest. I try, like I try being a good boy. So, but my little man, he loves them. Like he, like he loves crisps. I, I mean, we can, fr the ones that are in rings that you like to put on your fingers and then eat one at a time. He loves them. That, that's <laughs> his favorite. Yeah. If you, if you could have any bag of crisps though, which would be your favorite flavor? Pickled onion, monster munch. <laughs> <laughs> that was like that's 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 the easiest question. Next, <laughs> I want to talk about roast potatoes with you because people obsess about roast potatoes, and everyone seems to have their own secret for doing it, their own little twist and and uh, something that they picked up from somewhere of doing it. But I know that you have got a uh, a, a killer recipe. But to, to start off with a question that we've had from our Twitter following, um, Ellie underscore Morris 89 has asked us, what's the best type of potato for roasting? Again, it'll come down to season. And that's really it's such a such a easy blaggy question to throw away but i really mean it it's it's so difficult as well but i, I it, seasonality is big the one thing that i would say avoid massively are those great big washed baking potatoes you buy from supermarket because they contain so much water and moisture and they they're rubbish at making crispy they just they're just too watery is that true of big potatoes generally that they're going to be a bit they're likely to be a bit more watery no no not generally no, i mean again it just depends those on variety big bakers, just those, those big, bag big bakers. Baker, exactly I, I mean the best thing i say is go to your local farmer's market find a potato with dirt on wash it yourself roast it that it's going to be the best potato. It will taste amazing. It is fantastic. Those are the best ones to use. Alternatively, if you're in the supermarket and you're looking at all the things there, go back to the family favourite, the, the 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 estate car of the Maris Piper. <laughs> that's the one it will be. That's the one that will do it. That's why Maris Piper, everyone knows it because it ticks so many boxes. I live in Devon and when I buy potatoes with mud on the, and I wash them, the mud is bright red. It's the most scary colour. But how amazing do the potatoes taste? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the red is. I think it's iron or something like that. Yeah, but they really do like growing in, in Devon soil, Devon but, earth, and the rain that we get, of course. But fresh from the earth, <laughs> yeah. tasty, amazing. Amazing. Those are definitely the best way to have it. Once they've gone through the process of coming from the ground there, then go into the washing plant, the processing plant, then getting bagged and sent to the supermarkets. You know, all of that time that it's taken, that's when all the some of the, so much of the nutrients that and flavor that come from a potato begin to disappear. If you're lucky enough to have a little farm near you that sells potatoes, buy them every time. They're always going to taste the best. <laughs> Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. Let's make a vow to eat it fast, shall we? Yeah, I tell you, although they're not bad, mm. you might have to move mm. them out of the way because I might eat them mm. all. Is that my recipe? Yeah, it is your recipe. That's all right, isn't it? <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> This recipe for roast potatoes, which you'll find on bbcgoodfood.com, um, there's something a bit unusual about it. I think that people listening are going to say, oh, you've got to use duck fat or goose fat. You don't use duck fat or goose fat. What, you just use? Straight, plain vegetable oil, unflavoured, clean. It's clean and it's crisp. Not olive it? oil, even. No, olive oil, again, taint is flavour. I mean, I get it. You can use duck fat if you want. You can use goose fat. You can use olive oil. But that's another flavour that you're adding to the potato. Why are you adding flavour to something that already should be amazing? You, what, the, what are the two things that are beautiful about roast potatoes are the flavor of the potato the crispy outside it that everyone loves a crispy roast potato those are the things that you should be aiming at making special forget about the flavor of the oil you can drizzle on oil, olive oil afterwards if you wanted to serve them with roast duck just don't roast them in duck fat there's no need it, what you want to do if you're using just cheap ordinary vegetable oil is cook them in that because it makes them nice and clean and crisp and tasty and they're delicious well, we're going to taste your roast potatoes now, and I'm really very excited about that. The There's a, something that you do to the outside of the potatoes, which I find quite remarkable, because I know that people talk about scuffing them. Some people draw the fork over them to make little 
lines on them and kind of give them a bit of grip on on the edge. But you go one step further. So there's lo- there's a couple of different ways. Okay, so the first way that we do them in the restaurants is we cook them again a bit like making mash, where you b- blanch them and cook them all the way through, and then leave them to cool on a rack. And then you roast them in the oven, okay? So that way, and, and, a, and a great big roasting tray with a nice layer of oil in, get that nice and hot and don't crowd the potatoes in the pan. That's the most important. No matter what method you use, don't crowd them in a pan because then it creates steam. And the more you create steam, the harder it is going to get them crispy. That's our old moisture problem again. Moisture is, is. is the enemy with potatoes. Definitely. So you're trying to get, to get it out crispy. the whole time yeah. to get crisp and to get the flavour more kind of condensed. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But, there is a bit of a, a nicer fail-safe way. So in the restaurants, we'll do that. And then we've got great big trays. We've got great big ovens. We, You know, there's chefs doing it. But at home, if you want to get nice crispy skin, a nice way of doing it is if you cook them all the way through, not boiling, but just gently simmered, but cook them all the way through. That thing that people do where you put the lid on, pass the water off, and then shake the tin, don't do that anymore. Don't like. Th- there's no need for that. What you want to do is cook them all the way through so they're soft. Just gently lift them out and leave them onto one side to cool. Again, with your, your caress, your ingredients loving it but then the two most overcooked potatoes mash them up okay break them up mash them up and then mix into that some of the cooking liquor some water just to make this kind of like wallpapery paste this kind of and then roll the potatoes in that and that will give you this lovely kind of like very thin coating of potato mash and that will go really nice and crispy okay so as you put that into hot oil but again, don't steam it. And that will guarantee you having beautiful, crispy roast potatoes. It is a little bit of extra work, I know, but it is so worth it. I've never heard of that. It's really um, quite a different approach. I mean, I, I a few days ago, I encountered chips in batter, which I thought was quite a and remarkable thing. I, it was a picture of them and I had to say what on earth has happened to those chips? And he <laughs> said it, it's in Exmouth, there's a fish and chip shop that does f- chips in batter. I mean, I do want to try one. They were bright orange. I don't know how they went orange. It was normal batter, apparently. I think I've been there and have had you? them. Yeah, I do. I think I've been there and had them. In but, fact, I know I have. But it's not something that you have taken and run with, is it, Tom? N- no. But it was very good for that kind of chip shop style next layer of something that's quite interesting. I have had them. I have been there. It they are very they are very very good. Well, I'm off to Exmouth then. But before that, I'm going to make an exciting crinkling sound. Okay. You see, this is not sound effects, anyone. I, this is a, your actual foil coming off your actual real roast potatoes. Foil. We've got the real. Oh, they look sublime and we've got the real forks but i don't know whether we need we don't need forks do we (laughs) i think i think we just grab and we've got a little pot of sea salt as well yeah for for added should i sprinkle yeah yeah okay yeah i'll sprinkle the sea salt on don't be shy can can we hear this can we hear the sea salt spring the happy sound of sea salt being sprinkled can we hear that can we hear that Did we I get can that? I can hear that. We got that. Did we get that? <laughs> Sprinkly salt, lovely. And we've All got right. delicious aromas. This is a this essential trip for everyone listening. We've got the aromas of the roast potatoes tantalising everyone. They're and golden. They're lovely. They're, they're the they're, most beautiful colour, aren't they? And they got lots of. They do feel quite crispy, um, even though they've been sat there with. T- See, this is the problem, right? What's happened is they're warm, and you've put tin foil on the top, so that's created. A bit of steam. Yeah. And Enem- our old so, enemy steam. Exactly. However, do they still feel quite crispy? Yeah, to they, you? yeah they do. So, I mean, that's not bad. That was our fault for talking talking too much. Next my time fault. we'll eat the... <laughs> no, no, um, my fault entirely. But next time we'll eat the potato. If something comes up hot, let's make a vow to eat it fast, shall we? Yeah. I tell you, although they're not bad, mm. you might have to move mm. them out of the way because I might eat them mm. all. Mmm. Mmm. Can you hear us actually eating? That might be a bit embarrassing, isn't is it? Is that my recipe? Yeah, it is your recipe. It's yeah, all right, isn't it? <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> I know they enjoyed making it as well because these were these were these were crafted for us um, on the next floor by the Good Food Test Kitchen. Who well, they've done a remarkable job. They they uh, they're invincible as far as I'm concerned. And they they can they can do anything. But th- not that your recipe was particularly challenging. It just got the extra step of making the potato paste and rolling them in it. But and you then... can tell there's that paste on it, can't you? Mm. You can tell mm. that there's an extra bit of flavour mm. and crisp. 
And like you can see that there's like a coating on it. That it's, it feels like it's been painted on, and that's the bit that's really crispy and lovely. Mm. And can you hear? Can everyone hear us? The uh, sort of juicily munching our potatoes because we really have enjoyed those. With a big smile on our faces. <laughs> well, who doesn't love a roast potato? I have come away with from. I have come away from today inspired to up my potato game, <laughs> try a bit harder and to um, use your caressing action at every stage of a potato and to give the potato a bit more respect than I had for it sooner. Give the potato some love. <laughs> so thank you very much, Tom. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food.